We'll now begin our, our fourth and final uh, panel presentation of the day featuring uh, four judges who are all currently candidates for the Ohio Supreme Court for two vacancies on the court. Uh, just as a There, you go. there we go. We're getting a it's always me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, just, just as a formal matter, I want to state that the Federalist Society, of course, is not a uh, partisan or political organization, and so we take no position with regard to the race, but we're eager uh, and happy to hear from the candidates regarding uh, their views of, on a number of judicial uh, policy issues. Uh, first, I, I'll introduce the uh, participants in the panel. Our moderator today is Douglas Cole. He is a partner at the law firm of Oregon Cole LLP. He represents clients in complex civil litigation, including intellectual property matters, at both the trial and appellate levels. Uh, Mr. Cole has argued five cases before the United States Supreme Court and 25 cases in the Ohio Supreme Court and the Federal Courts of Appeals. He previously served from 2002 to 2006 as the Ohio State Solicitor under Attorney General Jim Petro, and he previously worked as a professor of law at the Ohio State University Mertz College of Law, teaching corporations, contracts, and law and economics, and still serves as an adjunct professor at Mertz. He, in addition to his law degree, uh, Doug, Doug has degrees in electrical and computer engineering, mathematics, and physics. Our judges, who I'll introduce in uh, uh, alph alphabetical order, uh, include Judge Craig Baldwin, who currently serves on the Fifth District Court of Appeals in Ohio. He was appointed to that court in 2013 and elected in 2014 and 2016. Uh, judge Baldwin also previously served for eight years as a judge on the Licking County Court of Common Pleas in the Domestic Relations Division. He earned his law degree from Capital University and his uh, bachelor's degree from Ohio University. Next, uh, Justice Mary De Gennaro was recently appointed by Governor Kasich to the Ohio Supreme Court. Previously, she served for 17 years on the 7th District Court of Appeals in Youngstown. Justice De Gennaro earned her law degree from Cleveland Marshall College of Law and her bachelor's degree from Youngstown State University. Third, Judge Michael P. Donnelly uh, serves on the, as a judge on the Cuyahoga Court of Common Pleas. He uh, earned his law degree from John Carroll University and his, or, I'm sorry, his undergraduate degree from John Carroll University and his law degree from Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Finally, we have Judge Melody J. Stewart, who currently serves on the 8th District Court of Appeals in Cleveland. She was elected to that court in 2006 and twice, I believe, since then. Uh, Judge Stewart earned her bachelor's degree in music from the College Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati, her law degree from Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and her PhD from K Case Western Reserve University. So judges, thank you all uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I am mindful of the fact that we're the last panel and the only thing standing between us and the reception, so I will uh, try to be uh, attentive to the time. Uh, but I think this is going to prove to be a very interesting and uh, lively conversation. Um, as everyone knows, and no surprise, right, we have a dual sovereign system here, and so that means there's two kind of parallel court systems, which leads to some uh, interesting issues and problems from time to time. But um, we're going to talk now a little bit in this panel about our state court system. Uh, uh, and unlike the previous panels where there was sort of one central question uh, that each of the panelists addressed, we're going to try and touch on various aspects, various different issues that will arise. So what I'm going to do is ask each of the, the panelists here, um, uh, as Matt pointed out, they're all four candidates for the two open seats on the Ohio Supreme Court this fall. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their judicial philosophy very briefly, uh, and then we're we're going to turn to a, a series of, of questions um, and hope to, to solicit some comments from each of them on, on various topics. Um, and I'm also hoping to leave maybe 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you uh, start thinking up some questions as we go along, that would be great. 
Uh, with that in mind, uh, why don't we jump in? Uh, everything's available on the internet, so I found a random number generator, uh, so nobody could claim that you know somehow I cooked the books or something. Used a random number generator to assign the order. So in terms of the uh, introductory statements, we're going to start with um, Judge Donnelly, followed by Judge Baldwin, and then Judge Stewart, and then finish with Justice uh, De Janeiro. Uh, usually, I'm the one on the clock uh, when I'm talking with judges, so uh, it's nice to have the role reversed a little bit and I will be doing my best to uh, keep things moving along. Uh, I ask each of them to keep their open remarks to about four minutes so we'll see how they are with uh, with time. So Judge Donnelly, right. why don't we start with you? All right, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It is an honor to uh, speak before this most respected organization. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I started my career as a criminal prosecutor in Cuyahoga County and then I went into civil litigation practicing a total of 12 years on both sides of the aisle. I did some insurance defense for about two years and then I represented plaintiffs. In 2004, I took the bench or I was elected and began my term in 2005. So I've served 13 years as a trial court judge in Cuyahoga County, one of the largest trial court judges, uh, general divisions in the state of Ohio. And I can tell you it has been an absolutely uh, wonderful experience. It's the best job I've ever had. I sometimes sit up on the bench and watch lawyers like yourself advocating and the thought flashes across my mind about what a privilege it is to sit serve in this position. It's a job I absolutely love, which might raise the question, why am I going for a job that uh, mm -hmm. I absolutely uh, to going away from that? Well, in 13 years, I realized that time is fleeting and I want to use all my energies, if I were ever uh, successful in getting this position to uh, work on policies, statewide policies that would improve the justice system both on the civil side and on the criminal side. I'm a judge that embraces the concepts of transparency and civil justice reform and criminal justice reform and I've built up a track record that I'm proud of trying to work for, for that. On the civil side, I've advocated uh, for a uniform case management order that would exist throughout the state of Ohio to provide litigators like yourself with the utmost trial date certainty and ruling date certainty. When I speak to lawyers, I, I, I constantly hear complaints about uh, delayed time in rulings. There's processes that we can employ to improve that, and that's what I would like to work on. I also want to uh, be part of the training of new judges. I want to train new judges to believe and to know that they are the judge on the case from day one, and they should be accessible to the parties, your clients and you, to resolve costly uh, discovery disputes uh, that add to the process of delay. Uh, on the criminal justice si uh, uh, side of things, I'm also a big adv advocate for criminal justice reform, uh, from bail reform all the way uh, through providing more transparency to the plea bargaining process here in the state of Ohio. Even though 97% of criminal cases are resolved through plea bargain, it remains a mystery to the public we serve. Two years back, if you Google my name along with plea bargain, you won't get a, a case that I was involved in, but uh, if, you, if you Google those two terms, you'll see that I tried to advance a rule in this state that would require what already exists in the federal system, and that is that plea agreements have a factual basis. I found a, numerous uh, cases in Cuyahoga County where, particularly in sexual assault cases, they were being resolved by allowing the defendant to plead to, to charges that have nothing to do with sexual assault. We advanced that rule. Unfortunately, it was rejected without comment by the, the Supreme Court, which led to the unfortunate headline that Ohio Supreme Court rejects in, uh, truth in plea bargaining. This effort was actually advanced, if you want to read out more about it, by prominent Federalist Society uh, Bill Otis on the Federalist Society blog. So you can read ab about that there as well. So this is my, uh, my goal. These are just a couple of things and we, hopefully we can talk about more issues I'd, I'd like to advance. I do want to talk about the mention of um, the fact that this organization is nonpartisan and um, I'm glad that was addressed because, as you all know in this, uh, this room, we as judicial candidates still in this state run under partisan banner. Uh, 
However, uh, and I know all the judges, my colleagues on this uh, stage, agree with the concept that pol judges are not politicians. The only policy that we should be concerned about is the fair administration of justice, and that's a nonpartisan uh, issue if I've ever heard one. I have the utmost respect for the colleagues that I'm sitting with right up here, and uh, you can expect there's going to be a clean race talking about issues. Everybody brings something to the table, and I'm glad I'm here, and I'm, I thank, thank you for the time listening to me. Thank you, Judge Donnelly. Uh, judge Baldwin? Thank you. Well, I am Craig Baldwin. I'm a judge in the Fifth District Court of Appeals. Prior to that, I was in Licking County uh, Domestic Relations Court, the Common Pleas Court. And um, before taking the bench, I was a partner in a law firm, Jones, Norpel, Liss, Miller, and Howarth in Licking County. And we practiced in uh, Franklin County, Licking County, all the <coughs> contiguous counties, uh, suburb counties of Franklin County. Um, general practice, um, lots of litigation, some insurance defense as well. and. Um, it was a good experience for the bench with all those issues coming in, in front of you, uh, good preparation for those issues coming in front of you. I um, went to Capital Law School, went at night, uh, worked during the day. Uh, my first job two weeks into law school was at the uh, Franklin County Municipal Clerk's Office, worked in the file room, and I was so offended when they put me in the file room. They had this brilliant law student with two weeks of law school <laughs> under his belt, and um, it turned out to be one of the best experiences I've ever had. Um, learned how a courthouse works, learned how the system works, how a courthouse works, how paper moves, and um, lots of good lessons that that laid the foundation for my uh, uh, legal career. After that, I worked uh, almost three and a half years for the State Public Defender's Office. They had just reinstituted the death penalty, and I worked uh, in the death, direct appeal death penalty section, which was also uh, a very good experience, particularly for someone who was headed eventually to the appellate courts. Um, was able to uh, work on a couple of cases that went to the United States Supreme Court, uh, worked on that, worked on those teams, and was able to carry the bags in the United States Supreme Court, which is something I do again today, and sit in that section right up by the justices. It was a great experience. Uh, promised myself that growing up in Newark, Ohio, I was going to go anywhere but Newark when I graduated and went right back. Uh, worked for a small firm, um, Swank and Wilson, two partners, and me. They literally cleaned out a closet, and I moved into that closet, and they gave me 60% of everything I made. I take that deal again today. Um, go back to that. Uh, went to, uh, after a few years, went uh, to work for another bigger firm, all of 12 lawyers, um, and became a partner at that firm, and was there uh, after a brief stint at the Licking County uh, uh, child Enforcement Agency, uh, ran for judge, and started my judicial career. I absolutely love being a judge. Um, this is what I've wanted to do um, my whole life. I saw a trial in the fourth grade on a field trip and went into that courtroom, West Courtroom in Newark, Ohio, in Licking County Courthouse. Some of you I know have been there. It's a beautiful place, and I knew right then and there I wanted to be a lawyer and be a, a judge. Um, so through God's grace and a lot of luck and a lot of help, I've been able to, to live that 10-year-old's dream. I um, believe, though, that it's more than just wanting to be a judge um, and whatever else comes with it. It's a great job. I hate to encourage anybody to run. We don't need any more people running. But um, I, uh, it's a great job, and you can make a big difference. Uh, I have strong feelings about our system, what judges should do, how the system should work. Um, like many of you, I've witnessed things in my, the time I was in litigation and traveling around, traveling around um, working as a practicing lawyer. I saw things happen in courthouses with lawyers, with judges, or with uh, lawyers and with litigants and jurors, and I felt like there were some things that we could do better. So I've worked hard. Um, we can talk more about this later, to do some of those things that raise the system up and that to, to work hard to make it so that citizens or their, that the fo those folks who go into a courthouse are treated like citizens in their courthouse and not like a, a case number or a case file or some bureaucratic, part of a bureaucratic machine. 
And that's why I ran for the Court of Appeals and why I'm running for the Ohio Supreme Court. I think we can raise the system and do better. Um, and I have strong feelings about my philosophy, a philosophy that many of you share um, in this room with me. I believe in the Constitution. I believe in the separation of powers. And I believe that when judges rule on an issue, they should look at that issue and be humble enough to stop and not legislate from the bench, uh, particularly important in, at the Ohio Supreme Court level. Um, that's why I'm running. Those are the values and principles that I've tried to live as a common pleas judge, as a Court of Appeals judge, as a visiting judge on the Ohio Supreme Court. And that's what I hope to do when I'm elected to the Ohio Supreme Court. Thank you, Judge Baldwin. Uh, next, we'll hear from Judge Stewart. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me in the back? Closer. Um, it is an honor for me to be here and participate in this forum w with my colleagues uh, to the left of me. Um, as you heard from Matthew's introduction, I got my undergraduate degree at the College Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati because with a name like Melody, what else was I going to study <laughs> in undergraduate school, right? So I got a bachelor's degree in music theory and composition and a, a classical pianist by training. And for law school purposes, that was wonderful because you studied torts and contracts and, and, and constitutional law by day. And I played Beethoven and Satie and Debussy <laughs> by night to keep the right brain, left brain going. Um, I've been an attorney for just about 30 years. And um, I started off doing civil defense litigation for the cities of Cleveland and one of the suburbs. I then got into academe and thought I'd be there for the rest of my life. So I started off as an assistant dean at my alma mater at Cleveland Marshall College of Law and um, later was able to, to have a faculty position there for several years. And I've also taught at the University of Toledo's law school and at Ursuline College, a, a uh, liberal arts college in uh, the suburb, eastern suburbs of, uh, of Cuyahoga County. I was elected to the Court of Appeals from one of my administrative positions at the law school. I've had the privilege of working at three of our nine Ohio law schools. <coughs> and I was an assistant dean at Cleveland Marshall when I got to the bench. I did go right to the appellate bench from academe. I thought um, teaching law, being published in the law, was, was uniquely qualified and more suited for the appellate court as opposed to the trial court. And so um, and during my time there uh, on the court, I managed to complete my doctorate, as you heard, at Case Western Reserve at the Mandel School. And that's important for several reasons. Having that degree teaches, has helped me ask the right questions in being on the appellate court bench, um, of the attorneys, of, of, of the impact and what they're asking of the court. And so I have found, and I was very privileged in the studies to be able to combine law and social science and do all of my work and all of my dissertation, for instance, was on juvenile justice and combine a social science and a, and a uh, judicial uh, and a law aspect for my work there. Um, I've been on the court a little over 11 years, um, twice reelected. And I have, I believe in, in public service on the bench and, and off the bench. I've been in, on numerous committees with the Ohio State Bar Association, with the Ohio Judicial Conference. And um, I currently serve on the board of the Judicial College of the Supreme Court. And I am also the chair of the Capital Case Attorney Fee Council here in Ohio. Finished, uh, I think, an 18th month stint on the Criminal Justice Recodification Committee, where we looked at our criminal laws across the state and, and made recommendations to the legislature. Um, I've also had the privilege of sitting by assignment several times on the Ohio Supreme Court and, and doing and doing that work there. Um, I think. Uh, one of the things that keeps me attracted to appellate law, being on the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, is the application of the law, but without losing sight of, of without, ha without having uh, lost sight of common sense also. Um, that's, that's not lost upon me. In, in typically reading a, a statute, uh, we, and I'm sure we'll get into the discussion about this, when we go back and forth about the plain meaning of the statute, or if the statute is unambiguous, you apply it as it says. My judicial philosophy is that. It's, it's you, you read what you apply. The facts always 
change the, the landscape of an opinion, at least for me. Rarely do we get facts that are identical to facts that we have seen before. And that's where the application comes, in, it comes into play on my perspective. For those of you who are not familiar, um, the 8th District Court of Appeals is the largest appellate district, at least by way of judges, um, in the state. You know, we have 12 judges, and so as you can often imagine, um, there are lots of applications to certify conflicts that come to our court. There are lots of applications for en banc that come to our court. And there's lots of applications for reconsideration that come to my court. I would venture to say we probably get more applications for en banc consideration than probably all the other districts combined. Because on any given day in the 8th District Court of Appeals, you'll have nine judges sitting deciding a case. And on a rare occasion, you might have two different <coughs> panels deciding the same issue, and they go opposite directions. <clears throat> so by the time the cases have been submitted and heard, we already have a conflict, or at least a, a, an intra-district conflict that we'll have to resolve. Um, but, but I have to say, it's the, the give and take that goes on in that court um, is tremendous. But why am I running for the Supreme Court? Um, as you heard about the work I've done in the past, and, and I believe in, in the, the public service that I do, that we all do, and I'd like to translate that to the appellate court. Certainly the election this year will not be about credentials and qualifications. I mean, I think the, the people of the state of Ohio are, are, are blessed, if you will, to have the candidates who are running. <clears throat> I just think that the perspective and um, what I have to offer would be good and, and best suited for the the um, Supreme Court at this level. So I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Judge Stewart. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Justice DiGennaro. Thank you, Doug. Um, being 6'1", as a gal, I'm very used to being at the uh, end of the line on a lot of things, and that's okay. And I want to echo my colleagues' uh, sentiments. It is a pleasure uh, to be here with uh, all of them. I've known all of them for a, a number of years. Uh, Melody, uh, excuse me, Judge Stewart, and Judge Baldwin, <laughs> and, uh, and I have been fellow appellate judges. Uh, Judge Donnelly and I um, work on a uh, judicial conference committee together. And um, so it's a real pleasure uh, to be with them. And uh, the voters are well served. Uh, this organization hosting this event is also very important because we know that it's very difficult for voters to get information about their judicial uh, candidates at all court levels. I think we're into the third or fourth cycle of the website uh, Judicial Votes Counts. Every judge on the ballot every year uh, can go to that website, put information about themselves, and the public can educate them and make meaningful choices on their judiciary. Um, a little briefly about my professional history uh, before going to the bench. Uh, I was uh, in a small civil uh, business litigation firm for 14 years. Uh, for those uh, lions of the appellate bench, and there's many of you in the room, uh, you can appreciate that for a civil litigator to be able to successfully get two cases into the Ohio Supreme Court is quite a feat. Uh, we won't <coughs> talk about how I did, um, but in any event, um, so I got two cases into the Ohio Supreme Court. Uh, in those 14 years, I did over 25 appeals in uh, primarily the 11th and 7th District Court of Appeals as a practitioner. And again, we know our county prosecutors are before those courts all the time. Uh, so that was the experience that I uh, brought to the 7th District Court of Appeals uh, 17 years ago. This is a very exciting time uh, for the Ohio Supreme Court and the legal profession in the state. Last cycle and this cycle, we are losing decades of appellate judging experience and uh, my 17 years brings that to the table. It is also a great opportunity for the court as an institution to look at itself and to look at how can judges and lawyers and the court work together to improve the administration of justice in the state of Ohio. So to that end, a couple of things that I've been involved with professionally. I am a founding member of the <coughs> Appellate Practice Certification Board. Uh, we're the friendly bar exam because it's all multiple guests as opposed to those dreaded essays. Um, 
I also am a big advocate and proponent of the specialty dockets. Uh, my public service includes having served on the, the uh, Alcohol and Drug Addictions uh, Board for Mahoning County. And as we've heard in the prior panel, uh, the drug and opioid crisis in this state is absolutely overwhelming. And uh, Ohio is a leader nationally on um, specialty dockets. We have drug courts at all levels, uh, juvenile, misdemeanor, felony. We have catch courts, which is dealing with the complex and myriad of issues with human trafficking. We have mental health courts. We have veterans courts. We have dual diagnosis courts. So that is an appropriate way for judges to have an impact off the bench and dip their toes uh, into the, <coughs> the policy world, if you will. And something that talked about um, at the other panel about sentencing, uh, you know, having a potential conviction hanging over your head is a great motivator to staying on track with the drug court. And it is not an easy task, and the judges who invest in that time and those teams and the defendants that are willing to face their addiction and turn their life around is hugely meaningful. And uh, one of the things I hope to do as a justice or continue to do as a justice is to advocate and be a voice in the public for the value um, of the specialty dockets to Ohio's budget, to Ohio's criminal justice system, because those participating are being held accountable for their behavior, but are turning themselves around in a much more effective way. And the re recidivism rates for those who go through a drug court is much, much uh, lower than for the general prison population. Um, Another thing that I want to advocate about um, as a justice, and the court, we are already looking at a lot of things. You know, two fresh eyes are there. I, I am a third. We're looking at issues to expedite our docket, uh, how to deal with jurisdictional questions. And for those of you who have heard the chief speak, um, another thing I'm very passionate about is educating the, the public about the importance of our independent legal system to our clients and our protect, prospective clients individually and to the community at large in this state and, and in this nation as well. Uh, we have seen nations still struggling to an independent judiciary and, and legal system, and unfortunately we are seeing nations around the world that are walking back with that. Um, we have always dealt with pressures as <coughs> practitioners and judges about our clients understanding the value of our work. And now more than ever, uh, the practice of law, what you all have to do every day is increasingly pressure filled. How to balance being a professional and paying the bills and facing the reality of what our clients are increasingly moving down the path of being legal consumers. The chief spoke at the State of the State last September about LegalZoom, uh, private arbitrators, eBay doing its own private arbitration, and that is something that the bench and bar has to work together. Um, you know, calling an operator on LegalZoom and getting a quick, cost-effective legal answer may sound good at first blush, but as all of us know, um, how many of us have had clients that said, well, I didn't think I could afford a lawyer, and then it cost them way more to unwind the problem because they did not get adequate representation. So it's very important for us to work together um, to address those kinds of issues and make sure that justice is administered fairly, thoroughly, and impartially um, to preserve uh, the value that, that we bring to our clients. Thank you, Justice uh, DiGennaro. Um, well, why don't, why don't we start with this? this is a question that's probably uh, near and dear to the hearts of uh, a lot of people in the room. Um, one of the principal jobs of a judge is to interpret written texts and apply the rules that the judge distills from those texts to the facts before him or her in a given case. Those texts can take a variety of different forms, of course, but among the most important are statutes, the Ohio Constitution, and the United States Constitution. Uh, as everyone knows, there are various tools for squeezing meaning out of text in the context of a given set of facts. 
They take on a variety of labels, textualism, originalism, various types of legislative purpose-driven interpretation, such as imaginative reconstruction or, or things along those lines, just to name a few. Uh, and even within those labels, there's a spectrum of um, judicial appetites for finding ambiguity on the one hand and thus being able to uh, you know, uh, interpret as opposed to merely um, applying the language of the statute itself. The, the question I want to pose, and, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll ask each of you to answer it uh, individually here in a second, but how do you think Ohio courts should approach the interpretive task as a general matter, and does your answer to that question depend on whether the text at issue is a statute or the Ohio Constitution or the United States Constitution? And, and Judge Baldwin, why don't we start with you first? Well, I think, um, you know, in terms of interpreting uh, statutes or the Constitution, we should look at the text first. That's where you start. Um, then you move on to um, the precedent. And as we talk about, or you hear different judges' opinions on this or different philosophies about this, I think those two are the most important, and that's the focus, and that's where, um, that's where we concentrate. You have other judges who talk about um, purpose and consequences of the particular um, whatever we're, we're looking at. And I think you gotta be very careful about that. The purpose, um, we've seen, I've testified in the State House, and um, we know how um, interesting that can be um, and how um, it's not really anchored to always what's written in the uh, legislative notes. Um, and I'm concerned about that. And the other part of it is, and we run into this in the Court of Appeals all the time, is the consequences of how we interpret that. I think we need to stay away from that too. Um, I think, um, as I said, uh, the, the, the looking at reading the statute, reading um, you know, I'm thinking about, I was in, I had a sit yesterday, we had, uh, it was actually a uh, contract, but listening to, and that's one of the great things about being a Court of Appeals judge is, is after your arguments, we sit and discuss these things. That's one of the most, that's one of the best experiences that I've had as a lawyer, because you hear these other uh, opinions and um, it's, it's, a, it's a great um, part of the experience. But it was interesting then, you know, um, the uh, talking about the history and tradition of this uh, case, of, of this line of cases and where it came from. And I am old school on this. I think we need to read the text and I think we need to look at the precedent and where I said in my opening statement, we need to be humble enough then to stop um, and not, it can be very, um, you can get a pull to go into the history, into the tradition, and you can get a pull definitely um, to go into the purpose and consequences of these things, and you have to be very careful. So that's Thank you. Judge Stewart, any ideas? <clears throat> I was going to ask you to repeat the question. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, sure. The, the, the question is, um, how as a general matter do you think Ohio courts should approach the interpretive task? How willing should they be to try and divine what the legislative intent was? Or how willing should they be to find ambiguity in the text as applied to the facts? And, and start bringing in some public policy considerations in terms of trying to get to an answer that you know, makes sense to the judge in light of the facts of the case versus um, applying the text of the statute as written. Okay, it was, it was that last part. Sure. That kind of lost. Um, <clears throat> again, and I, and I agree with, uh, with Judge Baldwin, if it's a statute, it's first a matter of reading the text and applying the plain language of the text. Um, and when I say that, it's, it's, it, and I am a textualist, it's, it's what does the statute say? But for me, it's also what the statute doesn't say. And if, the, and if there needs to be an application that questions whether a statute in its plain meaning means this or doesn't mean that, then I think we, we look to other aspects of the statute, particularly if there's no case law either in 
for my district in the 8th district or in any of the other sister districts and clearly whether the Supreme Court has spoken on the issue which is which is primary in the analysis <clears throat> excuse me a prime example is um, a, a case once it talked about a juvenile not having a statute that that deals with sealing of a juvenile record and your ineligibility to seal it if your juvenile uh, delinquency was for three particular crimes um, murder, rape, uh, and I think aggravated assault. And, this, and the legislature was clear that if you've been adjudicated delinquent for any of those offenses, you are not eligible for sealing. And we had a case where a juvenile was adjudicated for an attempt of one of those things. Now the statute doesn't say an attempt of one of those things. The statute makes it very clear. Those three offenses make you ineligible. Well, of course, the state argued, well, an attempt to do that is also the same as doing it. And there was some case law that, that supported that. This adult ceiling statute, however, written by you know, the legislature, says often attempts to do certain offenses of, of violence also is equivalent to that offense. So it was clear to me that if the legislature had wanted, if the, if the General Assembly wanted an attempt to do these things to prohibit or make ineligible offenses for sealing, the legislature clearly could have said that. So that was an example where, to me, you look at what the legislature didn't say in light of examples that they already had on the books. When it comes to um, precedent and stare decisis, which I believe is the next line of, of uh, analysis, um, that, that is uh, sacrosanct for me, except if you look at every now and then, you might get a case that's decided that was wrongfully decided, but went on for quite some period of time because nothing ever triggered its analysis again. But, but in that case, you do have to look hard and long at whether what you're deciding particularly to the contrary, should happen, either in my district, and then we have to do an en banc, or even if, if it conflicts with another district, and then we have to certify the conflict to the Ohio Supreme Court to make the final decision on it. And with regard to US um, Supreme Court case law, um, my understanding of its application is that it doesn't apply until the Supreme Court of Ohio says it applies. Uh, <clears throat> and so those are the parameters with which I work as an appellate court judge and that, that I th think we, we all should work. I, have, I am not and have never been an outcome determinative judge. It, it really is for me an analysis of what's before me and the law as it relates to that area currently. Uh, I give for a quick example. Uh, um, there was a non banc decision that we had in our district, State versus Rogers, in 2013. It was an 11 to 1 decision. I don't need to tell you who was the one, who was in the minority <laughs> view. So it was an 11 to 1 decision, and there were three opinions written on the majority view. And one of the concurring opinions actually said, um, I concur with the majority decision in this case, but I write separately for fear that the dissenting opinion will become the law in this state. Hmm. So in my dissent, I had to actually write, well, with all due respect to my colleague, the dissenting opinion is the law of the state. And it is you know, that my colleagues are writing the way they'd like the law to be. And I agreed that it would be better if the law were that way. But the law currently, as it stood, was not that way. And so I stood alone in the dissent. And I remember a colleague saying to me, doesn't it bother you that all of us are deciding one way and you're deciding the other way? And of course, I said, well, no, because you all are wrong. <laughs> so, and so the Supreme Court told them that shortly thereafter. So, Thank you, Justice mm -hmm. DeGenero. Thoughts on interpretive philosophies? It feels good when the Supreme Court tells you you're right, doesn't it? <laughs> it's funny, when, when you're, they agree with us on the, on the Court of Appeals, mm -hmm. they were wise. Then if they didn't, well, hmm. they got it wrong. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, quickly, um, with respect to statutory interpretation, of course, I'm a textualist. And um, you, know, you move up the food chain, the subsection, the section, the chapter, the title. Uh, I believe a judge has to work really hard before they get to questions of purpose and, and the I word, intent. Uh, we also need to use legislative history with great caution uh, because we know that has increasingly over the years have been very scripted events at committees, at subcommittees, on the floor hearings. Uh, 
So if a, a, a court or a panel has to try to glean what uh, an, or fill in a statutory gap, uh, we have to be mindful of those statutory constructions, and we all know there are those competing canons and things like that. Um, and we really have to look at the legislative history, um, particularly with the um, evolution of statutes. Um, I don't see any of my fellow um, oil and gas uh, law junkies here today, like myself. Um, but a, a good example of my judicial philosophy and, and what I mean about statutory construction is a big issue in our appellate district back in the day was which version of the Dormant Mineral Act statute was controlling, 89 versus 06. And um, I did, I have to own, I did quote a little bit of legislative history in my dissent because uh, it, it, one of the members indicated that one of the reasons for the revisions to the 06 statute was because the original version of the statute did not do what the General Assembly intended it to do. And my frustration in dissenting in all the cases that my district did was we don't have to read the proverbial tea leaves and figure out which statute controls. The legislature did it itself, and all the litigation took place after the 2006 statute took effect. So always, always, always we need to look to the, to the words of the statute, and I would tweak um, legislative history within that. As far as uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence, of course, uh, even the Ohio Supreme Court is bound by SCOTUS's interpretation of federal constitution interpretation. Uh, as far as Ohio's constitution, I am in the camp of we need to remember that a founding principle of this nation was federalism. We've gotten kind of fast and loose. We now call the national government the federal government. But federalism has its own unique meaning, meaning that you've got the national sovereign and 50 separate sovereigns as well. I believe it's very important that especially um, when we are interpreting Ohio's constitution that we do not, even when this, when this, when the the provisions are very similar or identical. We do not need to interpret our state constitution in lockstep with the um, national constitution. I think we have an obligation um, within the confines of stare decisis as Supreme Court justices to defend um, our state's sovereignty and our guiding principles in interpreting our constitution. For example, Ohio much more vigorously um, protects individual property rights than under the federal constitution. We all know the drama that evolved after the Kelo decision. Um, then Associate Justice um, O'Connor wrote a beautiful um, opinion in uh, Norwood um, so explaining how um, Ohio's constitution is going to afford on its own right more protection uh, for property rights for its citizens. Uh, you look at Ohio's um, constitution and it expressly talks about protecting um, in Article 1, Section 1, um, and defending and, excuse me, and acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, which is a much more specific and expansive express right than in the federal constitution. Going back to my dissents in the Dormant Mineral Act cases in a case called Tribbett, uh, finally the issue was properly raised to our court that the 89 version of the statute was unconstitutionally divesting pro uh, severed mineral interest holders of their property rights. Um, that case went up to the Ohio Supreme Court. As much as I would have liked to see the court uh, build Ohio's constitutional independent jurisprudence, the court wisely did not reach that issue because they determined the 2006 statute controlled. So they didn't need to reach the issue of whether or not the 89 version was unconstitutional or not. Um, so my last two final points on, on con law, um, it's also important for us as justices to be circumspect in when we do reach constitutional questions. Uh, if we can resolve it uh, through statute or, or prior precedent, uh, that's what we need to do. It, it is an awesome power that we have, and, and constitutional jurisprudence should be um, created incrementally and, and sparingly and no more than you have to. 
And a final note on stare decisis, the Gladys case that I sat on as a visiting justice in 2006 for the first time set an analytical framework for how courts in Ohio deals with the question if a case has been wrongly decided that an appellate panel or the Supreme Court is not willy-nilly reversing cases um, just because there's been a change in personnel or because we know what's wrong, but how do we get there? Um, so we've got that discipline uh, in Ohio as well, courtesy of the Gladys opinion. Thank you, Judge Donnelly. Um, I would agree with everything that my colleague said. Um, I believe we all take the same oath to follow the law uh, and you start with the text, as Judge Baldwin said. Uh, I remember when I was watching Judge Gorsuch's uh, confirmation hearings, um, how upset I was when I saw a senator who was not a lawyer grilling him about the facts of uh, a case that he upheld that was eventually dismissed because he was following the law and it had very sympathetic facts involving the plaintiff that brought the suit, and I, I thought how unfair it is and how it displayed um, a disconnect between the, the, the public that we serve and how they view our roles as judges. And um, as a trial court judge, I've taken my oath very seriously. Anytime a, a legal issue comes before me, um, I have never in 13 years denied a request to hear oral argument. I think that should be the practice statewide. Um, among trial courts, because I think it would lead to better decision and possibly less appeals, because uh, you go out, if there's a ambiguity, you listen to the lawyers, you listen for uh, controlling precedent, you have people distinguish cases. I come from a culture in Cuyahoga County where oral argument is actually discouraged. Uh, I, we tried to pass a rule two years back where if one party or the other asked for oral argument, uh, they would get it. Um, and it was uh, voted down, unfortunately, by uh, my, my court. He means on the trial court bench, not the appellate court. Not the appellate court. Not the appellate court. But uh, you know, I, uh, there's a record where you could, uh, I had one of the first cases after, it, those of you who remember when intentional torts against employers were prevalent here in the state of Ohio, and finally the Ohio Supreme Court had um, made its decision in terms of um, how that the intent that would be required for someone to bring an intentional tort and circumvent the workers' compensation system. I had that first case. I believe it was Hudik versus Thiazen, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I granted summary judgment in favor of the employer because I believe the facts did not arise um, to the level of uh, intent that had been articulated by the Ohio Supreme Court. I was reversed by the 8th District of, uh, in Cuyahoga County. Judge Stewart was not on that panel. But it, then it went up to the Supreme Court, and the final order was to reinstate my original decision. So I think you're dealing with four judges on this panel that all take that same oath. Um, and, the, and the way we interpret uh, the law um, seriously, and that's our role as judges. Thank you. Well, uh, related question, uh, and a couple of you touched on in your answers now, so maybe you can just give a couple of brief thoughts. But um, in addition to looking to the text, you often, as many of you noted, have to look to precedent. But one way in which the job of a Supreme Court justice differs in some ways from the lower court uh, judges is that lower court judges have to follow precedent, and Supreme Court justices have to uh, wrestle with the question of whether to change precedent and whether, whether to follow in a given case or not, typically uh, referred to as, obviously, the doctrine of stare decisis. Um, and on the one hand, you know, uh, change circumstances may make something seem wrong from the past. On the other hand, um, sticking with precedent gives you predictability and, and reliability in, in legal rules, which comes with certain benefits. Um, what do you think is the appropriate framework for thinking about stare decisis or thinking about when to overrule prior cases? Uh, Gladys is, the, is the, the current Supreme Court framework that, that gives some touch points on that. But you know, how would you approach the question of should we be revisiting or revising um, previous Supreme Court cases? And why don't we uh, start with Judge Stewart? Any, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, yes, I think uh, at the Supreme Court level it should be done with caution um, because when we talk about stare decisis and Supreme Court precedent, it might be that you're looking at a case that 
through age and through the changing of, of society um, um, requires a different sort of examination. And keeping in mind that sometimes not all precedent should be abandoned or reversed, sometimes it, it's, it's just not applicable anymore because the legislature has acted since the Supreme Court decision came out that, that no longer made the decision um, applicable. An example I, I, that comes to my mind is from our court in a case, State versus Renell Taylor, where the Supreme Court under State v. Joseph protected the constitutional rights of a criminal defendant to not be labor, uh, uh, burdened with court costs, having to pay them if the, court, if the judge didn't impose them at the time of sentencing. Supreme Court in Joseph says you, you, that's, that's a violation of that defendant's due process rights to not impose the, the cost of sentencing, but later put them in the journal entry in State versus Joseph reverse that. Well, then subsequent to that, the legislature acted and said a criminal defendant can ask for a waiver of cost at any time. And prior to the, the change in the legislature, the only opportunity you had to ask for a waiver was at sentencing. If the sentencing judge didn't tell you at sentencing, you never had a chance to ask for a waiver. State versus Joseph reverse that. Um, law change, the legislature said, hey, criminal defendant, you can ask for a waiver at any time. Therefore, it's still error, but it's harmless. At least that was my analysis. My colleagues differed, but that was you know, my analysis. So, so, there, so it, it should be done with caution, but it should, it should be done when it needed to be done. And I believe that still within the confines of, of, uh, of adherence to stare decisis, it still may mean it's time for a change in the law and the Supreme Court will then say, based on how the law has evolved, based on how the legislature has acted in a certain area, it's time for a change. Thank you. Justice De Gennaro, thoughts? A, a critical component of the question of stare decisis is uh, we as a court have to be patient and thoughtful at the front end of the process um, and be patient and wait for the appropriate case to um, address a legal issue that we know is percolating, has been percolating around the state or percolating through the, the, the uh, courts of appeals. We, we all know the old trope, bad facts make bad law. And um, I, I think that is a critical decision point for a justice on the Supreme Court is, is this the, here's the legal issue, is this the best case to uh, address this particular legal issue? You. Uh, Judge Donnelly? I would agree with my colleagues. It should be done with extreme caution. Um, however, you can, everybody in this room is familiar with U.S. Supreme Court cases that are now regarded as infamous. And I think um, if, you, uh, if you come to the conclusion that the decision was um, based on faulty reasoning, then that's, uh, that's something that you have to take into consideration. But uh, following precedent and, and the principle of stare decisis is something I firmly believe in. Judge Baldwin, any ideas? Well, um, this is the disadvantage of being last, because I really do <laughs> believe, follow <laughs> along with everything they say. I'll say this real quick, that I saw Milton Friedman talk one time. He said, governmental, governmental intervention uh, in the free market economy should be predictable, consistent, and infrequent. And I think it has great analogy to um, the discussion we have right now. Thank you. Well, uh, maybe a, a little more uh, practical question, move away from the theoretical here a little bit. Um, one topic that has garnered a lot of attention in Ohio of late, uh, and frankly across the country, is the opioid epidemic. Do you think that the judicial branch has a role to play in responding to that issue? And if so, what? And why don't we start with Judge Donnelly? Absolutely. And I think we're doing that uh, right now with uh, drug courts. Um, for the last seven years, I was a mental health court. So 25% uh, of my criminal docket were made up of individuals who suffer from schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and um, a lot of them suffer from um, the addiction to opioid use. And it's been said by, it's a, uh, 
bi bipartisan representatives that there's no way we're going to incarcerate our way out of this problem. We have to work on uh, treatment, so that educating judges, uh, it's, it's one of the strongest addictions I've, I've ever seen. I've had many uh, individuals overdose on my uh, uh, criminal docket. I have a stack of uh, entries that come up, unfortunately, when they say the case has been abated by death. And it's heartbreaking, and it's crossing all socioeconomic levels. Um, and it's something that the courts have to deal with, but we have to deal with it in a, in a totally different way. Um, uh, so, some people actually benefit from incarceration for, simply from the withdrawal element. But this is an addiction that's so strong that individuals can go two years without um, have, having a usage and relapse just, just like that. So the more we educate ourselves, the medical treatments that are available, I think the courts definitely need a, uh, to play a role in this. Judge Baldwin? I initially was uh, suspicious of drug courts and specialty courts in general, honestly. But I've become one over. I went uh, to a graduation ceremony at a drug court and saw the good that came out of it, and it won me over. And I would encourage any of you to do the same. It can be a moving experience. I've been to a number of these now, and I'm convinced that they do make a difference. Um, I think that um, anything we can do in the court system to be flexible and um, nimble about dealing with these situations um, it, it, through the probation, through um, the, all of those things through the drug courts is a positive thing. Um, we just need to make sure that we're results oriented, we're tracking those things and making sure that there is a positive outcomes. Um, thank you, Judge Stewart. Um, I'm, I'm taking probably a slightly different approach. If it's specific, what roles the court should play, if any, for the opioid crisis, I don't think there is one outside of what is already in place with the drug court and the mental health courts. Uh, other, other than what's being done through addictions of all sorts, and I know the opioid condition, uh, addiction is, is, is more strong and powerful, but outside of what's being done in the mental health dockets and the drug dockets, I don't see a role that the courts should play more so in the, in the opioid crisis. Now, the site, social science education in me would love to have some way to figure out to put more monies into prevention rather than municipality police departments with an Narcan, because I understand that those budgets are being busted wide open with the amount of Narcan that the police department's going to have to use. So I guess the short answer to my question is I don't see a role anymore than what's being done already in the drug courts and the mental health. Thank courts. you. Justice DeGeneres? Um, if uh, a recently retired colleague of mine were, were present and heard my answer, he would fall off his chair. I'm just going to say I concur with the panel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about alternative dispute resolution, uh, mediation, and arbitration. Uh, they seem to be playing an ever larger role in the dispute resolution process. Uh, former Chief Justice Thomas Moyer was a proponent of mediation, and he was instrumental in drafting the Uniform Mediation Act. At the same time, some people claim that alternative dispute resolution, and particularly arbitration, is harming the justice system by depriving people of a judicial forum. On balance, do you think alternative dispute resolution has been helpful or harmful to the pursuit of justice in Ohio? And does your answer differ if we are talking about mediation versus arbitration? Why don't we ask Judge uh, Baldwin? It does differ if I'm talking about mediation and arbitration. Uh, mediation, I saw the benefits of it when I was in the trial court. Um, if you have good mediators, um, a good system, a good protocol for that can be very helpful in moving the docket. One of our problems um, as a as in the judicial system is the pace and urgency um, on these crowded dockets. And I think mediation, if it can even pull some of the issues off the table, and you don't have to try every issue, you can try some, particularly in domestic relations court, we could go from uh, you know, 15 different issues down to five. It uh, makes a big difference in case management and docket control. Arbitration concerns me because of the, so often the mandatory nature and the jurisdictional, some jurisdictional problems with it as well. Justice DeGeneres, thoughts? Uh, and there is mediation at all levels. Um, I will admit to a little bit of skepticism when my um, court 
adopted a mediation program, but um, some of our fellow, our sister districts had um, gotten to that as well. We also have a mediation program at the Ohio Supreme Court. And fundamentally, a lot of participants in the legal system, they want to he have someone hear their story. They want to have someone hear their complaint. And uh, mediation affords that opportunity. Again, Ohio has a great tradition um, and experience with mediation. I'm, I'm a much bigger fan of that. Um, when I was a, a law student and did an internship with Federal District Judge George White, um, he told the story about, uh, and don't ask me how the heck, a automobile collision involving a motorcyclist got into Federal District Court, but in any event, um, settlement was attempted and both, you know, the, the motorcyclist's lawyer was trying to get him to settle, and it was a very fair settlement, as the judge would um, can relay the story. But the gentleman kept saying, I want my day in court. I want my day in court. Went to trial, and he lost. And, but the man's response was, well, I got my day in court. Um, so we need to educate the public that mediation is part of their day in court. As far as arbitration goes, um, we are seeing arbitration clauses being put in every aspect of our lives. It is an issue as far as giving the public access to justice. Uh, a huge problem with arbitration decisions is the narrow standard of review on appeal, by the time you get to the Court of Appeals, let alone the Ohio Supreme Court, it is like threading a needle. It is that narrow. And um, excuse me for not remembering, last year we had a case um, talking about arbitration clauses and things like that, so if anybody knows that the case and wants to shout it out, um, there is a case pending I don't know if it's before SCOTUS, the Sixth Circuit, or it might be before SCOTUS, talking about a particular um, aspect of um, arbitration. But um, we really need to um, look at that very carefully. And again, it comes under the heading of educating the public and even our clients, who could be some of these massive companies, about the value of the services that we bring um, as lawyers uh, to resolving disputes. Judge Stewart? Mediation, I think, is important because both sides are involved in the process. The strengths and weaknesses of both positions are pointed out by the mediator, and I think they're invested in the outcome, and it does um, decrease the time. Um, one of the things that Chief Justice O'Connor has um, put on us, uh, the Judicial College Board, is the fact that you know, our judiciary is, is more and more be not becoming responsive to the bar and its needs, and, and a lot of civil litigants are going to private judges and, and going more so to medi mediation and arbitrations. And I think my personal opinion, part of that, is that we have to find some way to have our judiciary as a whole more accountable, because after we're elected, short of you know some major scandal or committing a felony offense we're basically there until we retire or till somebody else comes and runs against us and knocks us off so for the judge who is diligent in his or her work let's say on the trial court bench and and grants hearings when hearings are are, are asked for and rules timely on motions you know, versus a trial court judge that lets a motion sit for six months nine months ten months over a year and then you say well that's a litigant's fault they shouldn't let that case set. They should, they should move the court to, to, uh, to rule on it or file a, a, a writ in a higher court to get it ruled on. But the practical application of that is the, is the lawyer doesn't want to alienate the judge against his or her client. And so there needs to be some way, in my opinion, that we have a little more oversight. I'm not saying every member of judiciary has to have big brother or big sister watching over his shoulder, but there needs to be some way that the judiciary is held more accountable and so that we're responsive to the needs of the people we serve. Because I do know there are people who just feel like, well, we're the only game in town. You gotta come to us for your legal matters and regardless of how long it takes, it takes. And if you get bumped as a civil litigant because of a criminal trial, then that's just the system. We have too many criminals and we've gotta find a way. We've gotta find the way to fix it. And I say we, but I mean we as lawyers have to do it. And, and, and I think the court system will be responsive to the needs of the bar. Judge Donnelly? 
Here's what I uh, feel about mediators. I think we have a lot of talented attorneys who are acting as mediators, and there's a definitely a place in our justice system for them. They're doing great work. They're bringing cases to a resolution. Um, as far as the trial courts go, um, I don't believe in the concept of ordering, especially if one side or the other objects to going to mediation. I don't believe that in that. I have, there's two judges on my court that that's their standard practice during the course of a case. Before you get to go to trial, you got your order to mediation. I don't believe in that um, philosophy. I believe in providing every uh, case with the highest degree of trial date certainty and ruling date certainty. Motions for summary judgment should have ruling dates set far in advance of the trial date so that you can get a ruling on the case uh, and not incur potentially unnecessary trial preparation expenses while you're waiting for the ruling. I know there's litigators in this room that have received rulings on motions for summary judgment on the day before trial or on the day of trial. That's wrong. And the, the judges that do that, they have no idea about the collateral consequences and lack of confidence that takes place among the public who uh, funded the, those motions and the discovery that it took to get to those motions. Um, so yes, mediation is great when you provide trial date certainty and the litigators the opportunity to get that discovery done and get to that point where they might be able to do a cost benefit analysis and settle the case. As far as arbitration, I'd like to see our courts become so efficient that if you have the opportunity to, between um, arbitration and the state courts, that you'll want to go to the state courts because it'll be less expensive and it'll be less timely. That's my vision for Ohio courts. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I don't want to hog all the fun of asking judges questions rather than the other way around. I know there are probably other lawyers who've been champing at the bit to do the same. So if there are people who have questions, um, please feel free to come to the mic. Uh, I see Mr. Carney headed that way now. <laughs> all right. Uh, a frequent recipient of questions himself. So, all right, yes. very good, Mr. Carney. There's no light, this is so cool. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to follow up on uh, some remarks Justice DeGenero made about when the Ohio Constitution is interpreted differently from the federal one when we have analogous or parallel clauses. And I'm wondering, I think no one doubts there are times that the Ohio one is different, but I'd like to ask everyone, even Doug if you want, uh, what analytical framework do you use for deciding when the Ohio one is different and if so how you draw or set a new standard under Ohio when you're unmoored from the federal one I guess we'll start with you Justice DeGeneres since it was tied to one of your comments okay well um, <laughs> And to build on my earlier comments, um, I, I always encourage uh, litigants, uh, particularly uh, in, the, in criminal cases, don't forget about your state court claims as well. Um, people always go to, we have flashbacks to law school, um, but we need to remember the Ohio Constitution as well. Um, trying to answer that question with and staying within the confines of the canons, um, it, it, it depends. It, it, you'd have to look at the particular um, section that is at issue. Um, a lot of the, the, the protections, you, you almost have to go with the Supreme Court because they've, they've set the bar um, that a state couldn't possibly give you any more protections on a, on a, on a particular issue. Um, so in a lot of cases, um, just by the nature of the issue and the right involved, uh, we're going to interpret ours the same as the U.S. Supreme Court. But, but there are those little niche areas, and, and property law is, is definitely one of them. Anyone else want to comment? I'll do that. I, I think, you know, it's, um, I've been influenced in this with Judge Sutton. Um, I've watched, have been in front, or watched him speak about how underutilized some of these state uh, constitutional provisions are and the extra rights that can be granted and he has four or five reasons um, the ge geography people don't do the lockstep uh, which Mary talked about with the federal constitution that's just what the way the paradigm that we see it um, the fact that there's some prejudice against state elected or judges being elected 
and um, a couple other factors that did have discouraged people over the over the years, particularly since the Warren Court, in uh, pursuing some of these criminal um, or, or some of those other alternatives. Um, but there's lots of case law out there. The High Supreme Court, um, I'm thinking, I know there was a search and seizure case, uh, State v. Brown, um, that explicitly put in there this is extra. And it's due to the Ohio, the, the Ohio Constitution provides citizens extra rights. I think that's an exciting thing. And um, I would share, maybe, maybe I drank the Kool-Aid, but um, Judge Sutton's view that lawyers and practitioners should utilize, not just in criminal law, but in other areas, um, those extra uh, protections that are built into the Ohio Constitution or whatever state um, we may be in. Others? No? Other questions from the uh, audience? Mm -hmm. Want to go up? All right, well, I'll ask uh, one more question um, uh, here. Uh, that is that one of the Supreme Court's jobs in Ohio is to oversee and manage the judicial branch. Uh, and they, they do that in various ways. Under the Modern Courts Amendment, they uh, have responsibility for the rules. But they just have a general supervisory responsibility, sometimes managed through writs or other things. Um, do you think there are any specific problems in the Ohio court system that you believe the Supreme Court should address through its management oversight? Uh, and if so, you know, what, what might they be? And we can start with you, Judge Donnelly. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm sure every litigator in this room has a, a story about unreasonable delay. Um, I have built a file of evidence that this exists. Uh, motions on class actions for certification of class actions pending for five years. Um, you know, as trial court judges, we're supposed to send in forms about <coughs> the status of our docket, and we sign those as affidavits. There's just absolutely no um, follow-up or verification on that. We need to provide greater transparency to our motions dockets, so we eliminate. Most of the judges in Ohio are diligent and um, very conscious about maintaining their dockets and providing judicial uh, timely rulings. But when you don't, I think the concept of filing a writ against the judge or um, filing a disciplinary action is just unrealistic among litigators who have to practice their next case in front of a judge. I even thought of a concept of having, with disciplinary counsel, an uh, anonymous motion hotline. So if, a, if a, a motion is pending and is ripe, that you could call in, or your client could call in. You don't even have to leave your name and say, this motion's been pending for a year, and there's no trial date, and we need a ruling on it. And, so, and that judge would get a call. If you provide more transparency, we're trying, in, in Cuyahoga County, we're uh, trying our best to get our motion docket, civil motion docket online, so people can go and the press, the fourth estate, can go and say, hey, this judge doesn't have a trial date on this dispute. And I've heard horror, horror stories uh, from litigators. One time I heard a, a, a judge uh, tell two parties to a suit that this case wasn't going to go anywhere but his DNR file. That means nothing's going to take place on it until he's dead or retired. That's wrong. Now, that's, that represents the, the vast minority, but when bad things like that happen, it causes lack of confidence in our, in our citizens that we, we serve. So the more transparency we can provide to trial courts uh, and provide you justice delayed is justice denied. I firmly believe that. And if I'm elected, that's what I will work towards for the, the litigators and your clients. Anyone else want to hop in? Uh, uh, Judge Stewart, go ahead. I was yeah. just, I, I'll just go back to what I, I said earlier. I, I do believe that there should be maybe a little bit more teeth 
to the oversight of the Supreme Court and the judiciary, and, and not just working heavy-handed, but working with all the courts, not just the trial court judges, even at the appellate level and, um, and at, the, at some of the inferior courts and the municipal courts, et cetera. I just think there needs to be more accountability, and I think for a lot of people who aren't simply motivated by doing the right thing and doing their job, that if um, there is at least a sense that a, a higher authority will look at what's being done, I think that might help to, to whip some additional people in shape. I see my con law professors. At oh, that. wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> did, did you guys want to hop in on that? I will. I will. I, I think that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not for the unified system. And I resist that unified system attempt that always sweeps in like the tide every once in a while um, or occasionally. But I think in education and discipline and rulemaking, um, we should, um, there should be some teeth and there should be some power to the court, um, more power to the court. I think it, again, goes to that predictability and consistency thing in the rulemaking. I think in the discipline, um, all those concerns we've talked about and Judge Donnelly just talked about um, can be solved by that. Um, but I think we got to be careful about that unified system. I think there's some beauty to those 88 counties and co court, courts of common pleas. Um, municipal courts and such as the laboratory um, for better ways to do things um, both in the courtroom and the courthouse and outside so that's my caution uh, the elephant in the room if you will is um, judge Donnelly's right Co uh, trial judges turn in a statistical report every month appellate judges every quarter but who is amassing and reviewing this data uh, pretty much it would be our, our fellow colleagues and the real heart of the matter is um, and if I recall correctly the administrative judge at the common pleas level gets the reports for every for his benchmates. What really needs to be happening, and we as lawyers and judges, because we are A-type personalities, we're professionals, we are mindful that if we sit in a multi-judge court of whatever level, we are all individually uh, elected and uh, responsible for our docket. But we have to do the hard thing as professionals, and if we see a colleague that is struggling, it, or is untimely, or a, 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 a judge's docket is, is, is that woefully far behind, we have to um, put aside our personal and professional discomfort and talk to that, that judge. Um, about getting things moving along. Um, the statewide docket is dropping statewide and the chief um, has um, started implementing statistical analysis and, and committees for every unique type of court in the state about doing a weighted workload study. Um, and, and this is some of the things that is going to be looked at. Um, there's a committee for the appellate judges for each trial bench um, to look at how we can keep justice moving along because some of the cases we're dealing with are, are much more complicated but you can't you can't hide the pride from the facts that statewide courts dockets are dropping well professor forte i think you get the honor of the last question here so Thank fire you. away much of this conference today was on the topic of originalism now when you come to interpret a state constitution the ohio constitution and so one of my questions is, have you ever had to, in your practice, look at a state constitutional provision and try to discern its meaning? What resources beyond the text are available to you for an originalist interpretation of a state constitution? I think Justice DeGeneres should answer you, first. Justice yeah. DeGeneres should answer first? <laughs> Okay. Justice, or Judge Stewart just uh, nominated you, Justice DeGeneres. Okay. Well, um, okay. I'm still, um, anyway. Um, well, let me start with the federal, federal constitution. I, I believe in originalism because those principles are so foundational and uh, so fundamental that they are timeless. And that is why when you're talking about Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, you can look to the original text um, of the Fourth Amendment and still protect people's privacy uh, in the age of, of you know, heat-seeking devices and tracking devices you put on cars and helicopters flying over your yards and, and all those things. And um, so too, um, with Ohio's constitution. Ohio's is a little more complex because um, 
I'm a very visual person. All right, so here's ours. <laughs> here's the federal constitution, which, by the way, this is as the Declaration of Independence and a bunch of other fun stuff. So that's even bigger than it really is. Our constitution has been added to through the democratic process, uh, through ballot initiatives and things like that. So it's a little more complicated when you're trying to interpret the Ohio Constitution. So again, I think it's driven by um, how the particular provision that's being uh, decided came into being, how it came to um, Ohio's Constitution. Um, workers' compensation, that's, that's all in there. Um, the casino thing, Marcy's Law, those are all things that were added to our Constitution by ballot initiative. And um, so you may have to take a few more things into consideration than you normally would in classical constitutional interpretation because of how Ohio's is built. Well, it's complicated because there's been more constitutional conventions. It's bigger, it's more complicated, it's been amended more. Um, and the constitutional conventions either give you more material or make it unwieldy to do so. Um, so that's, that's my thoughts on that. Judge Donnelly, Judge Stewart? I think as a trial court judge, I get to duck this question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you do. Well, oh, no, no I, the, the last constitutional issue I, I granted was on due process grounds. Uh, it was a... Uh, uh, the, pro the state was prosecuting an individual for possessing a, uh, a firearm uh, and a disability under a disability, and uh, the disability was created at the juvenile court level. And um, the evidence was that they were, n when they entered a plea at the juvenile court level, they were never put on notice. Uh, and I granted a motion to dismiss, and I believe that's making its way through the courts. Right now. And to answer uh, Professor Forte's question, I think where do we go to look for that again from at least at the appellate court level if we can resolve a, a question of law uh, by way of statute or by way of stare decisis before having to do a constitutional analysis, we do that. And so in the rare instances where we, where I can at least recall, and it hasn't it's been at least 10 or, 10 or 11 years, to look at it, it is looking at the Constitution itself for Ohio, looking at the Ohio Constitution going back to some original um, readings, if you will, on it. And for me, once I start down that path, then it can just go forever. And it might even go to, you know, my con law notes in class, if, if that's applicable. So, but we, and, and for, to think of exact documents and where do we go, it's, we, we look to at least my law clerk, my, my senior law clerk and I, we go to anything that is helpful to get the right answer. And I don't have any particular treatise or book that, that you know, we have in mind because of, again, fortunately, we've had to do it rarely because we're usually able to answer the question without the analysis, constitutional analysis. Well, with that, um, why don't you join me in thanking our panelists for being here this afternoon. <laughs> Judges and Justice, thank you all for joining us. We greatly enjoyed your presentation. We're happy to have you here today. Thank you. Um, I know everybody's, it's the end of the day and on Friday, so I'll be very short, but there are a few things that you should know. Uh, first, there will be a reception in the bar area down the hallway and then on the left in the same place uh, where the lunch was served. Second, um, if you should have received a flash drive with the CLE materials for today. I believe that has a uh, program evaluation on it. If you'd like to fill that out and return it, uh, we would appreciate receiving it. Next, if you are planning to receive Ohio CLE credit, you should have signed in uh, when you arrived to make sure you um, if you didn't do that, that you make sure to sign the sheet before you leave. And I will let you know the Ohio uh, CLE access uh, code is, there's six digits, 38, 33, 35. The magic number. That's 38, 33, 35. We will be submitting uh, the full list to the Ohio Supreme Court uh, shortly, so it should appear soon. But if you have any problems, you can use that, co that code. Finally, um, if you are not a member of the Federalist Society and you're interested in joining, uh, please go to fedsoc.org uh, for information on membership. We also have four chapters uh, here in Ohio, which are happy to have you attend their uh, regular events. Our, uh, Cleveland chapter, uh, led by David Tryon and Patrick Lewis. They're both here. Uh, our Toledo chapter, led by Matt Kemp, who's here as well. Uh, and of course, Ben Flowers in Columbus and me in Cincinnati. If you're interested in getting involved at the local level, we're happy to have you join us. So thank you all for being here today. Okay. All right.